Dialectical Sonorities, Carbon Footprints in Peter Culley's Climax Forest, a reading of Greetings from Hammertown. The study of how literary texts register modernity's ecological regimes through the lens of combined and uneven development has both expanded and nuanced our ability to read literature for its world historical meanings today. Any text might be read through its position in the world system and for its world ecological relations, including those relations determined by fossil fuel extraction, coal, gas, and oil. When we think in terms of world ecology, we see what historian Jason W. Moore calls Wall Street as a way of joining nature. Wall Street as a way of organizing nature, joining the accumulation of capital, the pursuit of power, and the co-production of nature in dialectical unity. In the following presentation, Tom Crompton and I situate our reading of Greetings from Hammertown, the opening poem to the late Canadian poet Peter Cauley's Hammertown trilogy, within a world ecological frame as Marxian dialectical and historical materialism. However, we are interested in what cultural historian Mirko M. Hall dubs Walter Benjamin's dialectical sonority rather than image. Grasped as dialectical sonority, Cauley's verse sounds his interest in technological obsolescence embedded within the ecological succession of deindustrialized landscapes, his approach to the poem as a kind of recording studio, and his practice of the intertextual and intermedial remix. We audit the multi-scalar relations his poetry mobilizes, including, indeed, what eco-critic Lynn Keller calls the scalar dissonance of the so-called Anthropocene. The first portion of our talk alternates biographical, historical, and theoretical context with a recording of Cully reading Greetings from Hammertown. This recording concludes about two-thirds of the way through our presentation before we return to the poem's first lines for a close reading. In this concluding section, we also project an excerpt from Paris 1919, another poem from the Hammertown volume. While Cully's poetry appears on the left half of the screen, the right half is divided between a slideshow in the upper right-hand portion, mostly of photographs of Nanaimo, BC, landscapes by Cully, who is also an accomplished photographer, and various media projected in the lower right-hand portion, including video works by artist Michael Ashkin, offering, we hope, illustration, soundtrack, and the occasional dialectical counterpoint to Cully's text. This media is identified and credited on slides at the end of our presentation. Huge uproar lords it wide. A timorous grader halts before an overflowing ditch. Its big bad boy body slumped as if thwarted at its gigging. In the shed's cartoon shadow, we dinosaurs sport and romp. Their urgent territorial beefs, strangely comforting somehow. The missives of October talk against the upstairs windows like desperate and ancient flies. Spending his early years in Air, Scotland, BC poet Peter Cully lived and worked for most of his life in the city of Nanaimo, Vancouver Island, up until his untimely death in 2015. In this time, he established himself as a formative, if deliberately peripheral member of the literary and artistic scene of mainland Vancouver. We read Cully as a poet conceptually situated between two poles of fossil fuel modernity, between Paris, capital of the 19th century, and the climax forest of the northwest Pacific coast on Vancouver Island. Cully's first collection, The Climax Forest, was composed at a site marked by British colonial commodity frontier making and within reach of residual climax forest. From within the Climax Forest emerged Cully's better-known Hammertown trilogy, a life work spanning three volumes. Hammertown is a fictive village introduced in an epigraph from Life, a User's Manual, a novel by George Perec that describes in what Cully characterised as the most perfect Parisian vision of Vancouver Island, a puzzle picture of a fishing port on the island, the puzzle being assembled by one of the novelist's protagonists. As concepts, both the Climax Forest and Hammertown provide scrims for a dialectical sounding of carboniferous psychosociality at the turn of the millennium in the mode of Walter Benjamin's Arcades project. Fuck 
I tried to climb the glass mountain, but I kept hitting the glass ceiling. So if you want to read decay into this rocky heap of nasty moss, this eggy newspaper insertion, that's your quattrocento prerogativo, buddy. But the pheasant remains, nailed to the outhouse door. The hair lints trembling past the dozen cat. The sedges and streams of my late youth are cleared and flattened for you, even as I write this. The damp air does not retard enlightenment. The engine of progress rests upon granite blocks. Hammertown does not indict an historical subject opposite objective nature. While eco-poetics is often defined as the poetry whose frame includes, in Juliana Spar's famous formulation, the bulldozer off to the side that was destroying the bird's habitat, with Cully, in lines you will hear, local woodpeckers are pictured pile-driving into the unyielding spruce, exhibiting their own kind of destructive energy. A world ecological perspective encourages us to, in Jason W. Moore's words, give up the sacred distinction of nature slash society and to reconstruct historical objects such as neoliberalism or Fordism or capitalism as real places co-produced by human and extra human natures. Close crowds the shining atmosphere. Luminous smoke billows orange from the bank wood fires of the working class, where earlier a row of beets had bloomed into a gleaming wound beneath the suddenly open sky. Alas, the Hammertown streets are certainly strange. Those few who walk them, hunched in the posture of exile, past grim houses with curtains drawn tight against the encroaching and aching night. Past the park's leaf-stuffed artillery, which points toward the empty middle distance beyond the boarded laundromat, as do the birchet streaked copper eyes of the founding father, whose massive hands rest blankly upon the open pages of a blank and massive copper book. Cully wrote his trilogy at one of the extraction sites for the coal-fired modernity that brought gas lighting to San Francisco. Opposite the poet's kitchen window sat the entrance to one of the mines, as he described it in a late autobiographical essay, Walking in Nanaimo, plugged with slack and now covered with trees, inhabited by a large and vocal raven colony. With mines frequently constructed in the quick, or ecologically destructive open pit style. Underground gas explosions and mining related accidents killed at least 450 miners in the Nanaimo area between 1877 and 1912. Cully notes that the street descending into the valley past his house was the one on which in August of 1913 striking miners chased scabs into the woods. As Cully observes in the above mentioned essay, the 1912 to 1914 miners' strike is the event around which the landscape radiates. The beginning of the modern world is inscribed here. Alas, in Hammertown, the days moved like buds or slugs, leaving translucent trails. The days moved like horned snails. Mountains, fields, and forests move through my brain in a flood of light controlled by blood until coming into focus the torn memory of another i don't know why i bother seated on an autumn boulder dappled sandstone above my shoulder a neat cube of green light if i am not mistaken is where i took the seat not taken across the concourse my double of was with a book of matches idly involved. He would not meet my gaze, nor I his. He lives in my house and is writing this. For dialectical reading, as Walter Benjamin demonstrated so vividly in his attention to the dialectical image, history and nature cannot be thought apart nor independently of a materially embedded consciousness in time that here and elsewhere is never fully present to itself. Thus, if there is a carbon footprint in Cully's Hammertown, it interests us 
less as a crude measure of carbon emissions than as a Benjaminian trace, or in German, spur. At this juncture, we follow Mirko M. Hall's expanded sense of this trace as dialectical sonority. Situated in a landscape where service work and tourism provide stopgap solutions to rising unemployment and destitution, Hammertown turns to the debris of extraction and ruins of analog technology as, as echo location sites for an emerging digital culture. Much in the way that techno and house music stepped into the acoustic spaces left by Motown as assembly line production fled the Rust Belt, as imaged and sounded dialectically in this video work by Mark Su, Several Circles, a piece Cully discusses in an unpublished essay. Below the unsightly plain, a brown deluge, near that edge of Hammertown that is a zone of permanent permission, where the damp, exhausted firework of polis bobs to the surface of a painted puddle. Where cattle from untasted fields do bitterly return, their lowing tinged with unhealthy intelligence. That light industrial luna park, where those that take their pastime in the troubled air, gather in tight knots of intransigence and woe, pouring their curses into the evening's dark flow. Struggling through a dissipated grove, one comes at last to a version of a path. Thus delineated, there is no room for hesitation, but it is all hesitation. The woodpecker rears back and slams its full weight, all the power in its teeny shoulders, peck, into the unyielding spruce, peck. works it right out, and slams it right out, and clears it right out, and erases the blackboard, and erases the tape, and pops the lid off, and tears the roof off, and boils it right fucking down, from an oil tanker to a teaspoon. Echolocation, which East Jim Cudwell defines as machine machine communication, here at work in this footage from Lee Scratch Perry's legendary Black Ark Studio, articulates the sounding at the heart of dialectical sonority when the echo is blasted out of the reified continuity of history. Here, the dialectical listening hall deems necessary to liberate self-reflection self from echo's reflex is inseparable from an act of sounding, necessary to locate alternate utopian futures amidst the temporally charged sonorities and displacements of capitalist ruin, audible in the harsh sonorities of the closing lines of Cully's poem. At length, into the obscure forest came the vision I had sought through grief and shame. A caravan of bright yellow trucks jostling like bland mud thugs along a granulate roadway of broken bottles. Bristling with crab claws, with arms like monsters barbed dog cocks, depositing layer after layer of bright sulfurous spore into a veil of rubber smoke. Sleep frighted flies, and round the rocking dome howls the savage blast. Beefs. Returning to the opening lines of Cully's poem, the punctual uproar disorientates at the same time as it sets a definite scene and gestures back across time with the line lifted from the final winter movement of the seasons, the 18th century long form work of proto-romantic Scottish poet, James Thompson. Huge uproar lords it wide, the clouds commixed with stars swift gliding sweep along the sky, all nature reels. The outlying timorous of Cully's second line shifts scale from the maelstrom of all nature from one Scottish poet to another, 
to the intimate exchange of Robert Burns's To a Mouse. In a direct address to his timorous beastie, Burns's poem functions as an apologia and appeal to the mouse, who recoils at the sight of him. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union. Curiously, Cully's timorous being is not a frightened animal other, but a piece of industrial machinery slumped before an insurmountable ditch. Cully inverts the dynamic of Burns's poem, mechanised attempts to flatten or grade the landscape, perhaps in preparation for the building of another prospective mall world, being disrupted by the unruly overflow of the natural landscape itself. Might we understand the ditch's overflow as a kind of negative feedback from the historical movements of global goods celebrated already in Thompson's poem? In particular, the deleterious effects of colonial resource extraction, the source of the scar that the grader tries to level, underwriting Nanaimo's environmental and social history. Throwing up the dense carboniferous layers within, this would give sense to the romping dinosaurs of the lines that follow. Juxtaposing huge uproar with timorous beasties and aligning minor strikes with Jurassic extinction exposes a scalar dissonance at the heart of the real place we call capitalism. Cully's poem claims this dissonance from the outset as we sense the huge uproar of global concerns and the strangely comforting romp of its wee dinosaurs, climate breakdown and Hammertown's local territorial beefs. Similarly, for Walter Benjamin, it is not so much the fanfare of state-sponsored public life as the rustling or rousing and a ephemeral clatter of mundane background noise that evoke the carboniferous psychosociality of his Berlin childhood. And this is from Berlin childhood. What do I hear? Not the noise of field artillery or of dance music a la Offenbach. No, what I hear is the brief clatter of the anthracite as it falls from the coal scuttle into a cast iron, cast iron stove, the dull pop of the flame as it ignites in the gas mantle. Mirko Hall comments that for Benjamin, sound's materiality corresponds closely to that of the dialectical image. The oral thunderclap of sound parallels the visual lightning flash of the image. As dialectical sonority, Cully's montage sifts discrete, tactile, sonic occurrences for the kind of hide-and-seek game that, for Benjamin, rustles from within a pile of leaves. Remembered experience intersects consciousness as echoes, trace structures, and the hearing of the present the medium in which the past is performed. This memory, Hall writes, is an excavation site in which the acoustic ruin of past experiences are severed from their original context and reassembled by a sober ear. Like Benjamin's, Cully's landscape is marked by impressions left by fossil subjects in their lived environment, tree rings in the climax forest and grooves in vinyl. In an essay on Vancouver artist Stan Douglas, Cully addresses how Jamaican sound system culture transformed the 45 RPM record from autonomous object to medium of manipulation. This is Cully. By re-recording a basic track, stripping it to its barest essentials and then fading in and out of certain accents, a work or two of the vocal, a fragment of hi-hat, a single bass note, and then subjecting the results to various degrees of echo and reverb, recordings of astonishingly dense and hypnotic elusiveness were created. Rhythm was reduced to implication. The recording studio became a self-reflexive device for examining its own traces. The remix is not limited to the recording studio, however, nor even to human agency, as when the topographies of Cully's native valley turn a nearby annual Hells Angels biker party into a pulsing drone that he compares to deep house music, as described in his unpublished essay on the work of Vancouver artist Mark Sue. Quote, this is Cully. The music performed over the weekend was invariably blues or blues rock, but by the time the sound waves reached our valley, 
they were distorted by the topography into entirely new structures. The treble and mid-range tones seemed to get trapped along the sandstone ridges and in the thick foliage. It sounded as if they were, as if in trying to escape from the valley, they were swirling around its edges in a tornado from the formation. Sound itself becomes sound itself becomes meteorological in the poet's hearing, while topography distorts blues rock sound waves into entirely new structures. Closer to Branca's no wave electric guitar drone and the abstracted pulse of bass tones drift like ambient weather, a visible thickening of the air, illustrating how the remix can be a mode of citation aimed at altering a song's atmosphere. Caught in such hearing, landscape separates out and remixes the different frequencies of amplified human song. The extent to which Hammertown refuses to sound culture against nature, or to set present against past, marks the poem's injunction to listen dialectically, attentive to the breaks, opening a gap between what sounds and what is sounded, and the montage of its hearing. This montage does not passively register, but actively co-selects co-distorts and co-mixes with the weather and the mimetic croak of corvids amongst other non-humans. The new recording, mixing, and sampling technologies that emerged successionally, as it were, from the cinders of the climax forest and the fossil fuels shift to a culture of reproduction enable a new relation to very old techniques, from the geo and biophony of earth sounds to the sounds of English poetry and the patterns of verse on a page. In scale of dissonance, a dialectical ear accesses the double movement through a double temporality, the future moving through the past and the past through the future. One sifts the ashes of the present for evidence of what will have been. One remixes this evidence for a different long ago, enabling us to think landscapes and their futures through images of degeneration as well as possibility, for history as well as for the escape from history. Cully's poetry shows us how life plays out at the edges of the party, the fall to the floor of global capital slowing down as it enters his native valley, where we might better order its textures. Listening with poetry that demonstrates its own provisional theories of making art and life in the deindustrialized landscape, we could be forgiven for hearing, remixed in the strange sounds of Hammertown, another kind of future.